started. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Unraveling Unemployment. Today's webinar is brought to you by ESI, and we are a PEO company, and our mission is to simplify the employment challenges of business by partnering with you and offering you our buying power, our efficiencies, and our expertise. I want to go over a few housekeeping items. So those housekeeping items are everyone will be muted during the presentation. So please use the Q&A section or the chat section to post your questions. Uh, the recording, the resources we will be sending out to you and the HRCI certificate will be sent out within a week of today's presentation. And as always, this webinar is not suited for legal advice. Our agenda today, we will cover the unemployment insurance basics, or we may refer to it as UI. We will also wanna teach you how to set yourself up for success when handling unemployment claims and terminations. And we also wanna to talk to you about high-risk termination and some red flags to be on the lookout. So now I'd like to talk to you about today's presenters. Today's presenters are Rachel Lint with Equifax and Cheryl Zhang of ESI. Cheryl Zhang is a human, res human resources business partner at ESI. Cheryl has worked in the human resources for 11 years and has experience in other industries, including banking, insurance, emergency management, not, and nonprofit. She holds a bachelor's degree in HR management from the University of the Incarnate, Incarnate Word. She has a PHR and SHRM CP cert certifications, and she is a certified Toastmaster and a trainer of trainers. She serves on the Small Business Council of the North San Antonio Chamber of Commerce and its members, and is a member of the local San Antonio HR chapter called SARMA. Cheryl, I will now turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Sheila. And again, welcome everybody to our webinar. We designed this webinar today for employers who use a PEO like EESI, which is a professional employer organization, but also for those who do not. So you'll see some references to that, but we, again, we've designed this so that uh, everybody's gonna have great takeaways um, and whether it's your human resources department or a PEO, we're gonna help you out. So as a PEO, we manage our unemployment claims for our clients. So that means my slide deck just flipped. So what that means is we're going to, uh, you don't have to know everything about unemployment. With that being said, that's why we're going to uh, kind of do a high level overview of the basics today. And also um, I'm gonna leave you with these links so that you can geek out on this stuff later like we do, sorry for the technical difficulties. Um, but again, high level overview of basics. We can give you more if you have questions, you're welcome to call us for that. All right, let me get the slides back up before we continue. All right, here we go, getting into it. Okay, unemployment insurance, we're gonna start with, unemployment insurance is a federal law. It is administered by each state. So what that means is most of the regulations are gonna be consistent across the country. You'll see a few differences state to state, things like the filing process, maybe um, the eligibility or some of the calculations on the back end. Uh, nothing to really get too deep into. And as you, you'll see through this, webinar, we're going to keep with the basics that kind of are more similar. Uh, the purpose of unemployment insurance clearly provide temporary income for workers who are maybe displaced or out of work. It's going to support the economy, and it's also going to encourage workforce participation. The workforce offices and the unemployment offices do this by providing job boards, maybe job placement, uh, some skills training, and even sometimes they'll do things like uh, child care, just to help people who are maybe needing that extra um, push or resource. That's what it's out there for. In most states, the maximum benefit time is 26 weeks that an employee can 
earn unemployment benefits. During some times of high unemployment, we will see the states or the federal government approve some extended benefits. This can either be an extended time period or a, a higher dollar amount. This will happen sometimes in a recession. You'll see it after a natural disaster or a hurricane. And of course, during the pandemic emergency, uh, a lot of displaced or unemployed people, there were some extended benefits during that time. So who pays for unemployment? Well, it's the employers. So for basically every wage that you pay, every dollar in wages you pay to employees, you're also, as an employer, paying a percentage of that into the state fund for unemployment. Uh, th they do put a cap on it. So each year, once you meet that cap in wages, then you're no longer paying the, the unemployment rate until the next year. So sometimes that rate, that cap, I'm sorry, will change between state to state, but that kind of um, gives you a little break and you're not paying for the whole year. And now the way that this unemployment rate or this percentage you're paying is calculated is based on the dollar amounts that were paid out to your employees by the state unemployment office in the prior year. So each year they're gonna look at your usage, so to speak, and determine what your rate's gonna be for the next year. We call those chargebacks. Um, this is really the reason, one of the main reasons we're here today because while we want employees who need unemployment to get it, there are times when they do not qualify. And so you really want to make sure you are keeping people employed anytime you can but also uh, disputing claims when it's appropriate. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. Another way to keep those rates low is by preventing fraud. So there's two types of fraud you'll see with unemployment. One of them is a fraudulent claim. This means that you have an employee who is not being truthful when they're applying. Maybe they qualify, but then they're getting paid in cash by some other job and they're not reporting that to the state. Or sometimes if they get a job offer, but they don't accept it, but they don't tell the state. Those are times when they would no longer qualify, but they're not being truthful. So um, that's a fraudulent claim. An imposter claim is just a little different because this involves identity theft. So if you get a claim from an employee, but they didn't file it, that's an imposter claim. There's a bad actor out there who has stolen that employee's identity and is filing the claim with their own checking account for deposit type of thing. So they want those monies to come to them instead of your employee. So the way that we try to prevent fraud, number one on the imposter claims, we just always ask the claimant when we get the notices, hey, did you apply for unemployment? Um, if they did not, then we're gonna report that to the state. With a fraudulent claim, this actually is where the employer can be the, the liaison. You're the one who may hear from their coworkers or their friends that they got another job. Or, you know, there you may have knowledge of that because you're closer to the employee than your HR department or your PEO. So those are times when you want to call us right away, let us know. Each state has a reporting mechanism for these types of fraud. And we stay on top of all of that, get that information to them. And that way we prevent that kind of waste, which will also help keep our rates down. So who qualifies? Unemployment, uh, employees who file for unemployment and they're not working at all, those folks can qualify. There are some eligibility things we'll talk about. And this can be if they're not employed at all and you don't expect them to come back. It can also be if Maybe it's only temporary. Uh, you lost a contract or one contract ended. You're waiting for the next one to start. So you need to get those employees off your books. You can't pay them right now. That's okay too. Your folks can apply for unemployment in those situations. They're also covered for partial employment. Maybe if you just had to reduce their hours, but they're still working for you or reduce their wages. Definitely encourage them to apply. Those are uh, benefits they may be eligible for. Workers also need to have enough time with you or time in the workforce altogether. So if they haven't worked for you very long, they may not qualify, but the states will let them know that. We don't have to uh, 
remember all those different calculations. There are times also when unemployment is not available. One in particular is for 1099 independent contractors. And just a side note on this, always let your employees know when they do need to apply for unemployment, do it right away. In most states, it is not retroactive. And so even if they wait a week, that's a week of wages that they've lost or unemployment they've lost. So keep that in mind and that can help your employees too. Oh, my favorite part, it's a checklist. Okay, this is the life cycle of an unemployment claim. You can have this to look at later like I do, or but let me go through it just so you get a little, um, just kind of another overview of how this process is working works and how we're gonna make it easy for everyone. So first, your PEO is gonna get the claim. Now, if you don't have a PEO, <clears throat> It's going to come into anybody at your office and who knows where or who's going to open it or whose desk it's going to land on. That's one of the biggest pitfalls of unemployment and of keeping your rate low is not even getting the claim, not responding on time. OK, so with your PEO, we've got technology we're using. We're getting everything on a daily basis. Um, once in a while, an employer who uses a PEO may still get a claim mailed directly to them, get those over to us right away so we can start working on them and meet those deadlines. Um, so once you get the notice, <clears throat> we're gonna confirm with the claimant that they actually filed. Remember we talked about fraud. And then we're gonna verify the separation reason. I'm gonna talk to y'all about those in a minute. After that, we're gonna gather evidence and we're gonna develop our response and provide a complete response to the state before the deadline. Once the state gets that, they may have other questions for us because what they're doing is also um, talking to the employee. So if the employee says, I was let go for this reason and the employer's response we send in says it was a different reason, you're gonna get either phone calls or if we're using technology, um, an electronic request for additional information. Those don't have a, a very long turnaround time, sometimes just a day or two. So you need to get on those right away. You can, if you get a phone call, if, if your state calls you directly, you can ask for another day, maybe another couple days, if you need to get with managers who are on vacation, just let them know the reason and they'll usually work with you. Um, that's one downfall of the technology. We don't always have that opportunity to extend, but we've got the technology on our side. So we're usually pretty much ahead of those. Um, so make sure you're responding quickly to the, for that additional information. And then once the state has everything they feel they need, they're going to make an initial determination. It's going to be in favor of the employee to get the benefits or the employer to not pay out benefits. And then you're going to have an option to appeal. Most of the time, this is a two-week um, turnaround. It may be different from the states, but it is a very firm deadline. So if you need to appeal, then make sure you meet that deadline. When you decide if you're gonna appeal, what you wanna do is look for any additional evidence. You, you'll be able to see what the initial determination was, why maybe the employee was um, received those benefits. And if there's anything else you need to then send to the state to address anything maybe they didn't have, make sure you get that additional evidence, get it over to the state right away, and they're also gonna let you provide some dates you may be unavailable for the hearing. Then you're gonna get the hearing notice. And that's why this is important because once you get the hearing notice, they're not gonna change that date very readily. There has to be, um, I'll just say I've never seen one change. So um, get those unavailable dates in ahead of time when you're appealing. So once you get the hearing notice, then, the PEO, the employer, your HR department, and any firsthand witnesses are gonna have a preparation meeting. You're gonna go over the timeline, look at the um, evidence that you've submitted and prepare for that hearing where maybe go over some process steps. Uh, don't interrupt the hearing officer. Um, don't get upset when the, the employee starts telling their story. Everybody's going to have a chance to talk and the hearing officer is going to lead all that. And I could have a whole nother webinar on hearings. Um, so we'll help prepare. 
and then we're all going to attend the hearing. It's usually a telephone hearing. And once we do that, it's back in the hands of the state agency. They're going to make their final decision, and then they'll send that out to us. So pretty simple on paper, um, a lot of moving parts, and it's nice to have a PEO there helping you through that. We do a lot of this for you, and we're going to show you that in a sec. Okay, here's our roles. All right, so we talked about all the things that needs to happen. So on one side, we've got the client company, the employer, and the manager, okay? What you want to do is interview and hire qualified candidates. And we say this because if we make a, quote, bad hire, that person's going to get unemployment when we have to let them go. Because the state feels like we should do our due diligence, ask the right questions, maybe do some pre-testing of the candidates. Maybe we need to look at our job description and make sure it's um, accurate to what the core duties are so that we can match the right person with that job. Because the way they'll see it is if, if we don't do that, if the employer doesn't do that, that's not the employee's fault. They're trying as hard as they can, but they were never gonna be successful, right? Okay, so when we see that maybe our tax rate's going up or we're not um, winning, so to speak, our claims, these are some of the things we're gonna look at. So that's where you guys come in. You're gonna hire the right people, then we're gonna give them training and set them up to succeed. We're also going to um, coach them and discipline when it's appropriate, and we're going to follow through with that, with documentation and uh, keeping up with progressing that discipline if there's no improvement. We're going to point to our policies. We always want to look at our policies. If an employee is not following a company policy, then that needs to be addressed in a formal way and let them know, hey, this is not what we expect, and if it continues, it's it could end up in further discipline or termination of your employment. We're gonna make these decisions timely. And this is important because if you start discipline and excuse me, and then maybe the employee still does it, but someone's not around or doesn't follow up, they don't progress the discipline. Six months later, now you're even more fed up and you let them go. Well, the state's gonna look at that as well, what happened during those six months? You must have thought it was okay because you didn't do anything. So we want to make sure our discipline stays in time with how things are happening. And the same with terminations. Let's say we have a, a termination for stealing, or maybe someone threatens another employee. If you wait two weeks, three weeks, a month to terminate that employee, again, the state's going to look and say, it must not have been that bad. And maybe there was something else going on. You just didn't like them. or we don't really know if this is a legitimate separation reason. So it calls into question and you don't want that. So we're going to keep everything timely. You're going to help us by participating in the unemployment hearing also. So then on the PEO side, or if you don't have a PEO, you could look at this as maybe your HR department. Um, we're going to make sure you've got handbook policies. We're going to offer training for your managers. Um, we're going to do those consultations with employees. Um, are having employee relations issues, they need counseling or coaching. We're gonna to respond to the initial claim. We've done it for years and we kind of know how to avoid some uh, phrases that may muddy the water, so to speak. So we're gonna do that. We're gonna communicate with the state agencies. We're gonna do the pre-hearing and hearing with you like we talked about. In fact, we're even gonna be the lead on the hearing. Um, we're gonna help with the appeals. Man we're gonna manage those chargebacks look and see if we're getting too many and if we need to maybe support y'all a little more. We also get wage verifications from the state and that's their way of trying to prevent fraud too. So we answer those, you don't have to. And then both sides are gonna still watch for fraud and report it right away. So this, you can kind of see which side is doing what and how we support each other. And then finally, here are the separation types. So. Lack of work is really what unemployment insurance was set up to do for you. It's automatically a time when an employee will be awarded benefits. There's no question they're laid off, they have reduced hours, and that's exactly what it's for. If, it, if the separation reason is not lack of work, then the state is going to determine if the employee is eligible. And they do that by looking at whether it's a quit or a resignation, so to speak, 
or if they were discharged. In a quit, you're going to see things like, hey, I quit. Here's my resignation, maybe a two-week notice. But this also includes things like walking off the job, a three-day no-call, no-show, um, or maybe they don't return from a leave of absence. And those are considered a voluntary quit, but there's a few things you need to do and documentation or reaching out to the employee to say, hey, for example, you were supposed to return from leave and we haven't heard from you or seen you. Is this your intention? So we're going to do that to cover our bases, to show our good faith effort to reach out if there was something uh, maybe an exception that was needed to be made. Otherwise, the employee is going to have the burden of proof of, hey, why did you quit? You know, because if you quit, you generally do not qualify for unemployment. A discharge, well, that can be all different kinds of things. It could be for cause. Um, it could be attendance issues that have added up or just one big incident that rises to the level of immediate termination. This is the most challenging for us. This is the burden of proof is on the employer. And this is when we're going to have to spend our time. And uh, Rachel is going to go more into this for you, proving our case that the employee should not get unemployment because of their behavior on the job. Um, so these are the three types of separations. And I think I pretty much covered the basics that we're going to do today. Remember, I'm leaving you some links to look at later. And I can kick it back to uh, Miranda, our colleagues here at ESI. If we see if we have any questions, we'll take a little break and do that. Or Sheila. Any questions, you guys? Hi, Cheryl. Yes, thank you. Sorry. It does look like we have a few questions. If an employee was terminated during probation, how do I respond? So, okay. If your state is an at-will employment state, which means you can, um, you can let them go at any time for any reason and they can leave at any time for any reason, a, a probation period really doesn't apply. So what that means is you are still going to want to document the reason and let the employee know that reason. This keeps them from making up the reason in their head. And it also makes you able to show the state what was going on that caused that, um, that reason for letting them go. Great, thank you. Looks like we might have one more question. If an employee is a no call, no show, what do I need to, why do I need to provide the dates? Didn't they abandon their job? Well, what the state's going to look at on a no-call, no-show is what dates were they scheduled versus what dates they didn't show up. So, I mean, sometimes you'll even have Saturdays, but what if an employee, what if employees are scheduled Saturdays? We need to show here was their schedule, here was the day they did not call. And again, that's usually, generally three days is, is a best practice. Some will go up to five days, some will do one day, um, but three days is your best practice. Show those dates scheduled, didn't show up, and um, that makes it very clear for the state officer to make their determination on. Great, thank you. It looks like that's all the questions we have for now. So for now, I would like to introduce Rachel Lint with Equifax. Rachel Lint started uh, with Equifax over 12 years ago. She started her career in 2010 and began began as a full service consultant and has been promoted throughout the years and is now a product trainer who delivers expert client training across many Equifax products. Welcome, Rachel, and I will turn it over to you. All right, thank you so much. Let me get my screen shared here for everyone. All right. So uh, today I'm going to be presenting uh, how to set yourself up for success to win that claim even before it's been potentially filed by your um, employees. So during the session today, we are going to cover some best practices on really how what you do from the time of hire, how it can really affect the handling of unemployment claims that are filed against your organization. So first we're gonna cover the importance of documentation. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about UI integrity 
which really is the driving factor behind how you should be responding to those requests for separation information, why it's so important. And then we're gonna go through some documentation best practices for those quit and discharge cases. And then I also wanna briefly talk about performance discharges. And then we're gonna finish up with a little scenario that's going to um, kind of bring everything together that we talk about. So hiring the right people for a position, it's tough. So, and it's probable that at some point you're gonna have a separated employee file for unemployment. So first we're going to talk about why collecting and creating documentation is so important for your organization's success when that unemployment claim has been filed. So truly documentation is your best defense against paying out unnecessary unemployment benefits, as well as helping you to protect your unemployment tax account from a rate increase. So it's very important that you document all events as they occur. So something that maybe in that moment or at that time might seem like a, a little minor detail that really could end up being a key piece of information or a key piece of documentation in a future unemployment claim. So as Cheryl was talking about earlier, you know, one of the most common questions we receive from our clients when we're contacting them about someone who has filed for unemployment is, why am I just now getting this claim? They haven't worked here in over a year. So the unemployment office, they're gonna send a claim out to any employer who has paid wages to that claimant within the last 18 months. So sometimes attempting to recall facts from nearly a year ago, that can be a bit of a challenge. And this is especially true if maybe there are other key employers or managers maybe that are no longer employed with your organization to help fill in some of those missing details. So before I go into the best practices for documentation, I do want to just take a quick step back and talk about the um, kind of need to understand uh, documentation and how important that is uh, and the details by talking about an important mandate that was passed back in 2011, and it was the Trade Adjustment Assistance Extension Act. And in part, that is commonly referred to as UI integrity, as you see on this slide. So in part, this act mandated that all of the states had to establish legislation and laws and regulations that would impose strict fine, fines and penalties on employers who are not providing timely and adequate information at that unemployment claim level. The state adjudicators, they need all of those details and all of that documentation so that they can make a decision on eligibility for benefits. So all states were required to be in compliance by October 21st, 2013, or they would face the loss of federal tax credit. So other than, of course, fines and fees and penalties that are associated with UI integrity, you might be wondering, you know, well, why does it matter if I provide an adequate response? Insufficient information, especially at that initial claim level, it can cause overpayments and unemployment benefits. And this creates a lot of frustration with really all parties involved. So the state gets frustrated because they have to recoup that money back from those unemployed individuals. And that's also going to create frustration with your ex-employee. So, you know, kind of imagine having to pay back that money that you just received that you're using for your everyday expenses. So it's really a good business practice to just help avoid cases needing to be appealed and needing to go to that hearing level um, because that's going to save time and money uh, if you just are winning it from the very start. So now that we kind of have a little bit of understanding as to, um, you know, why providing those complete details at the claim level is beneficial and so important for everyone, next I want to go over some um, best practice tips for documentation. 
Now, you'll find that with unemployment, you know, each separation type does require a different set of supporting documentation. So we're going to look at the two most common types, which are the voluntary quits or resignations and those discharges in which there's misconduct involved. So when you have an employee who voluntarily resigns, um, that employee is gonna have the burden of proof and they have to prove that they had a compelling and necessitous reason to quit. So that claimant has to show that they made every reasonable attempt to preserve that employer-employee relationship, but for some reason, just at the end of the day, they had no other alternative but to quit. So when somebody resigns, it's really best if you can get that resignation in writing. And if an employee resigns via text message, you know, that is very common these days, make every effort that you can to try and preserve a copy of that text message in that employee's file. Now, another common type of resignation is a verbal resignation. So if someone verbally resigns, ask that they, you know, put it down in writing for you and ask that they sign it. And if you have someone who refuses to put it in writing, then whomever receives that verbal resignation, whether it's a manager or maybe yourself, you know, um, write down what that resignation entailed verbally, uh, document the date and time that that resignation was given to you, and, um, you know, put your signature on the document and also see if the uh, the employee who resigned will also put their signature on the document. But at least that way, you have the details there that are documented um, so that later you don't have to try and reflect back and remember what was said. Now, whether you have somebody that's going to give you a two-day notice or even a two-week notice, it's also important to document that intended last day of work. And also be sure to add, once that last day kind of comes and goes, add to that whether or not that employee worked out that notice period. And if they didn't, why they did not. And then if possible, when they resign, try to get some details as to why they're resigning and add those into their file. And if your organization happens to do an exit interview, that's a really good time to get those details as to why they're resigning. Now, in the case of the discharges, um, it is the employer or yourself that has the burden of proof. So you must show that you had a reasonable policy that exists, and you also have to show that that claimant was made aware of that policy. So you must also prove that there was misconduct involved in that discharge and that that individual demonstrated a willful and wanton disregard of that policy or of their expectation as an employee. So the crucial, crucial details in any discharge is going to be the final incident details. So many states will look at an entire worker's history, but the decision on whether or not to grant unemployment benefits, it really does hinge on the final incident, um, you know, the straw that broke the camel's back, let's say. So the states are going to use those final incident details and they're going to determine if there was misconduct in that discharge. So when you're documenting those details, you want to capture everything. I cannot stress that enough. You want to capture who was involved, um, what happened, uh, where it happened, when it happened, and why, if applicable. So it's important to capture those details as soon as possible, right when they're fresh in your mind. And the same is true if there are any witnesses to what may have happened, you know, getting those witnesses to jot down their statement and you can add it to that person's file. So it's also important to make sure that you are including the exact policy that that individual violated. So you also want then their acknowledgement of that policy. So yes, you do have to show that the policy was violated, but you also have to show that that individual knew of that policy and you made them aware. 
um, of whatever that policy was that led to the discharge, essentially. Now, if you are in a situation where maybe you are um, putting someone on an action plan or a performance improvement plan, any kind of um, um, you know disciplinary type of thing, um, it's important that your document that you're writing up to present to them contains consequences on what will happen if they violate policy again. Include that action plan because that's really going to demonstrate to the state that you had that conversation with that individual, you were attempting to partner with them, alerting them on what they needed to improve on, you know, really anything that you could do to help correct whatever the matter at hand was. And finally, anytime you have those kind of constructive conversations with your employees, always a good idea to, to get their signature on those documents. And I know that sometimes that is a little bit easier said than done. Um, you may find yourself in a situation where someone just flat out refuses to sign. You know, maybe they feel that putting their signature on there is an admission of guilt. So that's when I always recommend that if you're, if you're able, whenever you are having those kinds of conversations, to have a witness present. So that way, that witness can sign those documents, and that's going to increase that document's credibility, even if that person still refuses to sign. It's going to create an additional person that has firsthand knowledge that can say, yes, that conversation took place because they were there when it happened. Now, before we go into that discharge scenario, I do want to also briefly talk about performance discharges. So performance discharges, they are a little tricky. They do fall into two types or categories. So I always like to talk about what those um, performance discharges uh, are and what the difference is between them, because it's, um, like I said, it can be a little bit tricky. So the biggest difference between these two types of reasons for separation is one is protestable and one is not. So any kind of misconduct related performance issue is a protestable reason for separation. So what that means is that you can protest or challenge that uh, former employee's receipt of unemployment benefits. So your um, protest, it can result in that person potentially being disqualified from receiving those benefits. And it could also result in your account not being charged, which truly that is the, the most important is to not have those charges against your account. Now, an inability to perform the job. So that's what we call poor, uh, poor performance, no misconduct. That's a non-protestable reason for separation. So it's kind of similar to those lack of work situations where um, you know, that individual really didn't do anything wrong. They just um, weren't a good fit for the job is really what it boils down to. So that typical or that type of reason for separation is going to um, usually find that the claimant is going to be granted benefits. Because, you know, remember, unemployment really was designed for um, to pay out those benefits to individuals who have been unemployed through no fault of their own. So sometimes people will accept work or jobs with good intentions on performing it, um, but for whatever reason, they're just incapable of performing up to your company standards. You know, maybe they lack some training or experience. Um, you know, it, it, I'm sure you've all been in situations where you make a hire, you put them through training, and for whatever reason, they just, they never are able to perform that job. There's no misconduct. They're not purposefully, you know, uh, trying not to perform the job. They just can't do it. They're just not a good fit for the position. So that's usually going to qualify someone for unemployment benefits. And conversely, Unemployment benefits, they are not awarded to those discharged when there is misconduct. So, uh, you know, we talked earlier about kind of what that definition of misconduct is. You know, um, they, um, you know, aren't um, 
they have a disregard for you for your interest as an employer. Now, another way that I like to think of this is would not versus could not. So if you are ever in a situation where you have a performance related discharge and you're trying to figure out, well, is there misconduct or is it inability? The best way to do that is just take a step back and ask yourself, is it that that individual just flat out refused or would not do the job or is it that they could not do the job? So for the would not category, you know, if you have somebody who has been meeting standards in the past, you're able to show um, yearly performance reviews, let's say, where they got, um, you know, achieves expectations or even exceeds. Uh, if you're also able to show that they received merit increases because of their job performance, and then all of a sudden they just stop, you know, they just stop performing for whatever reason. That's going to be someone who would not do the job. Now, someone who could not do the job, they're working to the best of their ability, but for some reason, they're just not able to maintain or meet the minimum standard. So really, the difference between the two, it just comes down to effort and intent of that individual. All right, so let's kind of just wrap this up all together here um, and go through maybe a common discharge scenario I'm sure most of you have probably experienced. So this scenario involves our claimant. His name is Chuck Claimant. And as you can see here on March 12th is when he was hired. And as he went through orientation, the employer went over all their rules and policies and they reviewed those all with Chuck. And it was also during this time that he signed an acknowledgement of the handbook and the employer placed that acknowledgement inside of his file. Because again, having that signed acknowledgement, whether it's pen to paper signature, or if you have an electronic signature where maybe they go in and make initials, that also is absolutely acceptable. You wanna have that on hand because that's what's going to be your proof. Um, that you went over those policies and uh, your individuals or your employees knew what those policies were. So Chuck did all of that. The employer put him through orientation and he acknowledged all of those policies. So after a couple of months, he did not show up for work one day and the employer did try to contact him by phone. Uh, they called, sent him some text messages and he never responded. So on the day of his next scheduled shift, Chuck came to work and he was given a verbal warning for not following the proper call-off procedure. And he was asked if he knew what the procedure was and he said that he did. He knew that he should have called off at least two hours before his shift was to begin. Um, but he let the employer know that he didn't do that because he wasn't feeling well and he just fell asleep and forgot. So the employer made sure to make notes that they had a verbal discussion and they put that inside of his file. And the employer also recorded the date and time of that discussion and just a brief synopsis of the conversation that took place. And Chuck also agreed to sign the document at that point and just acknowledge that they had that conversation. So a couple more months go by and Chuck fails to show up for work again. And just like before, the employer tried to reach out, never responded. So on his next scheduled shift, the employer called him back to the office. And during that time, he was given his first official written warning. And on that warning, they, uh, the employer outlined that he failed to report to work on July 20th and that he did not let the employer know that he would not be coming in before his scheduled shift, at least two hours. And the employer also noted that Chuck acknowledged that he understood that policy upon hire and during that verbal conversation that they had previously. And Chuck was also reminded that any further attendance occurrences would result in a second written warning. And he promised he was going to do better about remembering to call out per policy. And then he signed the document again without any issues. Now, as you can see here, not even a full month later, Chuck did not come to work again. And like before, didn't call in, did not respond to the employer. 
So again, the next day they met with him and he was given his second written warning. So the employer outlined that Chuck failed to report to work on the 20th of July and again on August 10th, um, did not let the employer know, outlined the policy that was violated um, and also put in there that Chuck did acknowledge he understood that policy upon, upon hire and on the previous conversations they had with him. And he was advised of that next step. Any further issues, he's going to get a final written warning. And if there was an incident uh, within 30 days after that warning, he was going to be terminated. Now, this time, Chuck was a little angry. He did not sign that warning. Um, but luckily, there was an assistant manager in the office at the time that that took place along with the manager. So that assistant manager was able to place her signature on that document. And the employer did also make a little note that Chuck did refuse to sign. So again, on September 5th, he did not show up for work. You've been following along. We know where this is going. So when Chuck came the next day, the employer did follow through. They issued that final written warning and they did outline that, um, you know, the next step any, any um, attendance issues within that next 30 days, it's gonna result in immediate termination. And once again, Chuck got angry, you know, he didn't like hearing that he was gonna be fired next, stormed out of the office. But again, that witness was there. Um, they got all the appropriate signatures and put that he refused to sign. So just when it looked like things might be turning a corner, uh, Chuck arrived 45 minutes late for work on October 1st. And since he was told during that final discussion that any other occurrence would result in termination, the employer did follow through with their policy and they did terminate him upon arrival. So after he was terminated about a week later, the employer did get a request for information on an unemployment claim that he filed. And it was really easy for them to provide all the details because they had them all outlined on those um, prior warnings that he had received. Um, they had the policy that he violated outlined on there, what the consequences were, the next steps, and then most importantly, they followed through, the employer followed through with, with those consequences and that, that action plan. So um, it was really easy for them to provide all those details on that unemployment claim. All right, and uh, that is the end of my presentation. Um, if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Great, thank you so much, Rachel. It does look like we have uh, just one question here real quick. What do we do if we have, um, if we don't have any formal documentation or no one was written up or the manager didn't um, keep track of, you know, say their attendance or something like that, how do we handle those situations? Yeah, so in those situations, um, not all hope is lost. Uh, you still are able to provide those details, you know, um, to the best of your ability. Now, I will tell you that the state will ask for documentation. I mean, that's pretty much a given in any discharge situation where there's um, where it's not a lack of work, let's say. Um, and without the documentation, it's not, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean no documentation means that you're automatically going to lose, you know, or that that person's going to automatically get their benefits. You never know what that individual, what that claimant is going to say when they talk to the state. Um, but without documentation, it does make it a little bit harder for you to prove your case. So, yes, you can explain, give all the details until you're blue in the face. But sometimes the state's like, okay, great, prove it you know, I need a copy of the policy and the acknowledgement and the warning. So without that, it can be a little difficult, um, but it's definitely not a, you know, all hope is lost situation. I always encourage employers, still give us those details. Let's respond to the claim and let's see what happens. Great, thank you. And it looks like we have one more question. How would I respond if an employee was asked to resign because they sued the company? Ooh, that is a great question. Um, I've never heard that one. <laughs> and yeah, whenever, whenever I have uh, a client of ours say anything about 
um, any kind of possible, um, like getting in, you know that the claimant has a lawyer, you know that they have, um, they're, they're talking about suing you for a wrongful discharge or whatever that might be. That is when I always recommend go to your internal legal team, let them know what you know about that potential lawsuit and see if pursuing unemployment and pursuing that claim is something that you even want to do. And the reason I say that is sometimes depending on the state, if that claimant has a lawyer, that lawyer can use um, all the details and um, documentation inside of that unemployment claim as a means of discovery. So I always advise to tread lightly on those. Um, sometimes uh, legal departments have come back and said, you know what, just let that unemployment claim go. Um, you know, if they're going to collect, that's fine. We will handle this, you know, from the, um, for, you know, from a, a legal perspective and handle whatever that lawsuit might be. Great advice. I do have one more question. If an employee's, I'm using air quotes, behaves during their probationary period that you've put them on, say a performance improvement plan, something of the nature, and say it was set for 60 days, if they behave during that period, does that reset? Or let's say day 61, they did something. How would you handle that if it ultimately led to termination? Does, does the time reset? Um, and that, that's another great question and a common question we get. And truly that depends on number one, what your company policy is about that. Now for unemployment purposes, um, especially let's say, you know, day 61, whatever that behavior is, you know, it goes awry again, follow whatever your company policy is to, um, you know, handle that matter. But for unemployment purposes, it's still good to provide all of that documentation and all of those details, you know, um, because even though on day 61, they blew it again, let's say, um, you're gonna be able to show a pattern of behavior. Um, so even though they were on their best behavior for those 60 days, but then on day 61, they weren't, um, still gonna be able to show the state, hey, look, they have a pattern of this behavior or of not performing their job or whatever that is. Um, we can prove that by, you know, we put them on this performance improvement plan. Um, it, they seem to do better during that time period, but then, you know, right after that expired, it started happening again. Um, you know, because the states will look, especially if it's any kind of behavior issue, they will look at, um, you know, not like a little beyond the final incident, let's say, they will look to see like, okay, did this person just kind of go off the rails one time or was it a common occurrence with them that, um, you know, they had this repeated behavior in their file. Great, thank you, Rachel, we appreciate your time. And now I'm gonna turn it back over to Cheryl to close us out. Thank you so much, Sheila. Great info, Rachel, love that. Okay, let's um, share my screen. Is that again? All right, now that we've done all our documentation, we've got our some kind of more common. Now, just real quickly, some high risk terminations. And what I want you to take away from this is so a warning. So the warning is look out for these things. Don't bury them. Don't ignore them. Make sure you know what to look for. Because as a frontline manager, as a business owner, anytime you have an employee who maybe they've been a long-term employee and they have performed well and something else is going on. Maybe they have a medical issue or maybe they've always been a problem employee. What does that mean? You know, are they having a, a personality clash with someone else or can you tie their behavior back to your policy or your their job description? So, 
you need to be careful that you're treating everybody the same, that you know what protected categories are. For example, um, people are in protected categories based on their race, their religion, gender, uh, national origin, age, disability. So know those things to look for, but this doesn't mean that you have to be the expert to handle it. That's the encouragement I'm gonna give you because that's why your PEO, your Rachel, your HR department, that's why we're here for you, but you need to know to escalate those, to bring them to your consultant or to legal. Some of the other red flags that you'll see, we just, I just mentioned personal problems. Um, those are difficult to handle. Uh, social media posts. When is it their own time and when is it yours? When does it affect your business because it affects your reputation? When are they protected because under the union laws, union organizing laws, they're allowed to discuss their working conditions. So bring in other folks. Don't just make a quick snap decision and terminate somebody when you see some of these other issues. And finally, reporting any type of safety violations, harassment, discrimination. If somebody does that, and then maybe they do have a legitimate reason they're gonna be, you're gonna terminate their employment. Um, maybe the discipline was ongoing before that. But after they make those claims, you do need to make sure that you can defend the fact that the reason was not retaliation. Oh, they called OSHA, they gotta go. So um, again, these are some things y'all as managers, again, we could do a whole nother webinar on, but I wanted to make sure y'all saw these and just feel confident that if you see something like this, take a step back and bring one of us in. All right, and that's what we have for you today. Um, well, let me turn it back for any other questions we might have. All right, well, if we don't have any questions, I'm gonna give it to our moderator, Sheila. She's gonna wrap us up and let you know what to expect after the webinar. Sheila, take it away. Sorry, I was having a little bit of technical difficulties. I have gremlins in my computers, y'all. <laughs> well, thank you so much, and we appreciate you for joining today's webinar. As always, this webinar was presented by ESI. And just to remind you, uh, ESI, uh, we help you simplify the employment challenges of business by partnering with you with our buying power, our efficiencies, and our expertise. Just a few reminders, we will be sending out um, all of the tips, tools, and trades that we went over today within a week of today's webinar. We will also be sending out that certificate and the recording of the webinar uh, will be available to you on uh, various social media outlets and we will let you know that. Uh, it looks like we do not have any other questions. Let me just check real quick. Yep, we're good. So Rachel and Cheryl, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for your time and thank you everyone else for joining us today and we look forward to seeing you on our next webinar. Thank you and have a great day.